There are 5.3 million people in this country choosing not to work and living off benefits in some way. Is that right? Well, I don't think it is. 1999, there were three of us from UKIP elected to the European Parliament, to the horror of the establishment. Funny, my first day in Brussels, the three of us sat here with two foreign office acolytes, and there was sort of an interminable 30, 40 second silence, which the ambassador broke by saying, gentlemen, what are your intentions? I think he thought I was a terrorist. I, mean, I, I said, I'm not Guy Fawkes, I haven't come to blow it up. Welcome to Disruptors. I'm Rob Moore. Before we dive in, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. Nigel, we have to ask this question, don't we? Yeah. Who's going to be the next UK Prime Minister? I keep being asked, who's the best? Who's the best of the two? It's the wrong question. <laughs> Who's the least worst, <laughs> I think, is the right question. It, it's a bizarre, isn't the whole thing bizarre? Utterly bizarre. We've got 160,000 people choosing the next prime minister. 60% of that electorate are over 50. 40% of them are over 65. And they will choose the next prime minister. It's a very, very odd system that we've got. I, I have to say, in the early rounds... I thought Suella, Suella Braverman, I thought, said some very interesting things. Uh, she, she was looking for solutions. In particular with her, it was the cross-channel migrant problem, which we've learned in the last 24 hours. It's huge young, uh, numbers of young males absconding before we've even taken their biometric details. We then got Kemi Badenoch, who I thought said some stuff on social issues that needed saying namely stop poisoning our kids at schools and universities. She was eliminated. And we finished up with the Chancellor and the Foreign Secretary. Surprise, surprise. So we really have a continuity election. Um, we're really, at the moment... What does that mean? Well, it means we carry on much as we are. It's just, do we stick with the current level of tax policy and the proposed increases, or do we not do them? Uh, which is what Liz Truss is arguing. But on everything else... There's no sign to me there'll be any change of direction in this government at all. Sunak, to me, is an uber-globalist, um, very apologetic for the Chinese regime, for the Chinese Communist Party, whereas I think we should be viewing them increasingly as being a threat and perhaps the biggest threat that we face in the world. Um, every indication to me that Sunak has... No comprehension of small business. In fact, almost despises small business. Interesting, wasn't it? As all the money was being dished out, left, right and centre during the pandemic, uh, you know, furlough money, all the rest of it. Who got nothing? The three million people in Britain who are directors of their own limited companies. And when he was asked a question during the pandemic on that, not only did he, not only did he say, we're not going to give those directors money, he said, but in time, small business must start to pay its fair share. Which I thought was the most incredibly anti-entrepreneurial thing you could ever hear from a chancellor. So I'm not for Sunak at all. I think he would be, as I say, very bad news. I don't think he's an entrepreneur or conservative. I suspect if he loses, he'll be living on the west coast of America within two years anyway. As for Liz Truss, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, <laughs> And I don't blame her for going to the CND marches. I don't blame her for that. She was a kid. But when she was an adult, she was a Liberal Democrat, arguing very strongly for us to get rid of the Queen, uh, which is not my turf, as you may well imagine. And then as a Conservative, she was strongly Remain, voted three times for Mrs May's deal, and now she's apparently the biggest Brexiteer in the whole of Westminster. And she's come up with this new sort of Thatcher-like idea that if you cut taxes, you increase growth in the economy, which, by the way, I think is right. And I think Sunak's wrong to say cutting taxes will put up inflation. No. If you cut excise duties, you're reducing prices. So I don't actually buy the Sunak criticism. The question with Liz Truss is, does she actually believe in this? Or is it a reinvention in order to win the top prize? So if I was a Conservative Party member, I couldn't vote for Sunak. I think I'd sort of just cross my fingers and vote for Liz Truss. I think she's the least worst of the options. But I also think, Rob, more significantly, she'll win. She'll win. I mentioned already the age profile 
of the Conservative membership. And, you know, somebody who's a Margaret Thatcher tribute act is actually gonna, <laughs> is actually going to be quite appealing. Or the crueler ones say she's a pound shop, Margaret Thatcher. But, but so, so, <laughs> so she's going to win. She, barring any disaster, she's going to win. The biggest threat to her is, is the Penny Morden camp. And my God, didn't they throw the kitchen sink at Penny Morden? Now, she probably deserved it. But if Penny Morden is looking for revenge, then you might start to see some newspaper articles appearing through the Daily Mirror, to begin with, about aspects of Liz Truss's personal life. I won't go any further than that, as we're being recorded, we're going out live. But uh, yeah, they might have a go at her personality, they might have a go at some of her private behaviour. That could cause a difficulty, but I don't think it will. I think she'll win it very comfortably. So the answer is, long answer, but I hope it was useful, that Liz Truss, I'm almost certain, is going to be the next PM. I want to pick out some business entrepreneurship and tax issues a bit later on. Right. But you mentioned about the system and essentially 160,000 people voting for the next prime minister. So how is the system broken and how could it be better? Well, if you think about it, actually, I mean, I'm old enough to remember general elections. I wasn't voting, but I was going into the polling booth with my parents when... In our constituency, there were three names on the ballot paper. No party, no symbol, no put your cross by the image you like the look of the best, didn't even have the names of the parties. You were voting for men and women to represent you in that constituency. And then the Prime Minister was the person that was decided to be the first among equals, right? That was how our system worked. We voted for MPs, the Prime Minister came out of that. Increasingly, we have a presidential system in terms of how we vote without it being a presidential system. Be in no doubt. You know, the vast majority of people who vote in general elections are voting for, or more likely, against somebody. You know, I live in Sunderland. Um, our family have got four generations of British Army soldiers. Jeremy Corbyn's the Labour leader. You know, we see him as unpatriotic, anti-army. We're going to vote Boris. You know, so that's how we vote. So we're in a very bizarre situation where, bizarre situation where we're actually voting like the Americans, but in a British parliamentary system, which is why so often we keep changing prime ministers and the public say, well, hey, where are we in this? That's the first thing that needs changing, Rob. I think the second thing that needs changing... I think the first past the post system is now just massively out of date. There's a big appetite for change in the country, particularly in the younger generation. You know, even when you get big swings in elections, even when you get a Labour landslide, Tory landslide, you still find that over half of seats in the country never change. And so, you know, if you're a high Tory living in Sheffield or, you know, you're, you're a socialist uh, living somewhere in Somerset, um, the feeling that what's the point? of going out to register the vote has, has got stronger and stronger and stronger. So I think we need an element of... I'm not saying we should go full PR like Italy and become totally ungovernable, although it's always amusing to watch Italy try to govern itself. Um, but, but I think it's very interesting. I mean, I mean Blair actually... Blair, a lot of things Blair did, I, I think, were very detrimental to the country, but Blair, early Blair, was thinking. And early Blair appointed Roy Jenkins to set up a commission to look at our electoral system and did it fit as we moved into the 21st century. And the Jenkins Commission came up with a, a proposal which is a system called AV+, where the man or woman still represents Guildford, but with the second ballot paper, you can express an opinion on who you want represented for the last 25% of seats in Parliament. And that would mean, with a, you know, with a sensible threshold of, say, 5%, that any significant view in the country that wasn't represented in Parliament actually would be. So I think AV plus would be good. I think the postal voting system, well, Peterborough. I mean, what happened in that by-election in Peterborough three years ago, I fought a court case over that. I lost, but I'm absolutely convinced that, and hey, you know, just over the road there is a place called Tower Hamlets. You know, the guy got elected, Rahman got elected mayor, went to prison for postal vote fraud. And guess what now? He's just been re-elected. 
as mayor of Tower Hamlets with a massive postal vote. I think the whole, I think absentee voting is fine. You know, you work abroad, you're 97 in a wheelchair. You've got a reason not to turn up on the day. Uh, but I think actually that would be two to three percent of the vote. I think we should turn up on polling day and vote at polling stations in the privacy of a polling booth where nobody else can intimidate us. Um, and I have to say this, the French, who get almost nothing right, <laughs> but, this they've got, but this they've got right. To vote in France, you have to turn up. You have to show identification. You're ticked off a register, so you can't come and vote again and again and again. And nobody in France questions the result of elections or the integrity. Increasingly here, there have been rows, court cases, imprisonments. In America, there's a hell of a row going on about the last election, for, for good or bad. And finally, when it comes to electoral reform and actually bringing our system in this country of how we make laws up to date uh, and, and, and a bit more in touch with people, is the House of Lords is now an abomination. I mean, it was difficult to defend it on hereditary principle. Now it's just stuff all a load of Tony Blair's, David Cameron's mates. And when Boris goes in a few weeks' time, there'll be 30 more of Boris Johnson's mates in the House of Lords. And nearly all of them live in the same three postcodes in Kensington and Chelsea and are not representative of the country at all. And that's the upper chamber. That's the upper chamber amending legislation in our country. I, I just think we have to move to a Senate of some kind where we, where, where we actually vote for people who have the right to amend and change legislation that affects every, every person and company in this country. And, and actually, you know, one of the reasons I was so for Brexit is I do think that making your own laws in your own country means you've got a chance, actually, of doing things that are more appropriate for your nation, for your circumstances. So, and this is the biggest disappointment, Rob, of all, of all, really, is those Brexit voters in the north of England, they weren't just voting on leaving the EU. It was actually a cry to stop London dominating our lives and, and London attitudes dominating our lives in the way that they are. They were voting for a new kind of politics. And what we've got, we, I mean, literally under Johnson, we return to the Eton, Oxford, old boys club, the chumocracy, and nothing changed. So, you know, I'm a real radical in this sense. In the, in the, I think the moment is now to change, modernise, update, reform everything about the way the country's run. So we have to talk Boris, of course. <laughs> so what do you think of him finally resigning and what's his legacy? Um... I've known him a long time. I first met him when I was a commodity broker and he was a, tele a telegraph journalist. We met through a mutual friend he'd been at school with. Um, he's he's likeable. He's <laughs> the first lunch we had, right, was in Christopher's in Covent Garden. And they were in the days working in the city when you weren't expected back in the afternoons. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, you'd either made or lost money by lunchtime, and that, that, that was pretty much it. And so, you know, we sort of toddle off to lunch at 12.30 and, and met Boris, and, and, and clearly Boris was also in no hurry to rush back to the Telegraph. And I think we sort of, it wasn't, it wasn't you know, an epic one, but I think we, I think we sort of, but it was sort of four o'clock it all finished up, you know. And, um, and I do remember distinctly that as we left, uh, Boris was given a piece of paper by the waitress and it was her phone number. So he's very good at that sort of thing. <laughs> he's very sociable. Through the years, through the referendum, and I spoke to him a lot and we sort of coordinated together, um, I, I got the impression that he was a fantastic cheerleader but not a leader. And I felt from the minute he went into number 10, I've been saying for a long time, actually, on GB News, this is going to go wrong. This is going to go wrong. And in the end, if you think about why he was brought down, Rob, it, they were all unforced errors. They were all self-inflicted wounds. And then it was the attempt to cover them up and to probably mislead Parliament into the bargain. And that's what did for him. And I, his legacy will be that we got a form of Brexit over the line. His legacy will be that we showed through the vaccine rollout, as it initially was, 
that being freed from the Brussels bureaucracy actually meant we could do stuff and do it more quickly. His legacy will be, for good or bad, that we got involved in Ukraine in quite a big way and gave a lead, again, able to do that, freed of being part of an EU uh, sort of mutual foreign policy. So he will be credited with those things. Um, the history books will say, here was a man who had the most incredible opportunity with an 80 seat majority to do some incredible stuff, did none of it and was brought down by lies. And I think we'll look back on it as being just the most terrible waste. They had a fantastic opportunity to do some amazing things in the last few years. They just haven't done them. So, you know, for him on a personal level, I guess it's very sad. Uh, whether he's reconciled himself to it or not, I don't know. But, you know, we've all met people in business, in life, you know, the sort of Billy liars, the people that you know they're never telling the truth. And they probably themselves actually haven't worked out now whether they're telling the truth or not, because that's how they live. Um, and, and Johnson has got away, you know, with being very, having a very loose association with the truth for a heck of a long time. But you can't do it as prime minister. You can't do it as prime minister. And the country started to lose confidence in him. Up to a third of those who'd voted conservative in 2019 were frankly disgusted by the way he behaved, um, particularly in the home counties. People were absolutely appalled in the home counties uh, by the way in which he behaved. And then in the end, the MPs caught up with it. He's gone. I suppose you could argue in some ways it's the system working. There was a degree of accountability in it at the end. You could argue that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, did some good things, but what a waste. As someone who knows Donald Trump, is he misunderstood? Hugely, deliberately, willfully. That's because he's challenging the global establishment on almost everything. He's got his faults, he's got his flaws, but he's a great guy and he woke us up to something that none of us had really thought about properly. China. So two questions off the back of that. What would you say are the top specific things that Boris failed at that brought him down? And what could and should the new prime minister do differently? Um, I think, I mean, what brought him down was the lies. What he didn't do, the missed opportunities. Well, the argument is that the pandemic meant that they, that they, that, that they couldn't do anything. That Whitehall was paralysed because of the pandemic. I don't buy that. Whitehall was at home drinking beer in the garden. It's called work from home. Whitehall wasn't work. Whitehall's still not working. There are still departments in Whitehall where only 30% of the staff have come back to the office. So I don't buy that the pandemic stopped us from doing things. His job was to cement Brexit in the sense of showing the population there were benefits to be had from this. It's like moving house. If you move house, there is a downside cost to moving house. There's you know, conveyancing, there's aggro, there's time. But the upside of moving house is you're upsizing or downsizing or you know, you're going somewhere that suits you better. And you try and benefit from that, whether, it, whether it's you've moved to the country or whatever it is. We'd left the European Union. Necessarily, there are some costs attached to that, some downsides attached to that, but also some massive potential benefits. And, you know, they literally have done nothing to go through. Estimates vary, but roughly 150,000 pages of close type legislation of EU law incorporated into British law. That was the stuff to go through to simplify to clarify, to get rid of in certain cases. Um, I mean, here we are in the city of London, you know, regulations like MIFID II that haven't brought a single benefit to any private investor whatsoever and yet have driven a lot of our equity brokerages off to Zurich or New York or whatever it is. You know, they're the things they could have repealed. They're the things that, that, they, that they could have got hold of. He also, I think, uh, when, it came to, when it came to VAT, I mean, Taking 5% VAT off our domestic fuel bills was a promise that all of us made during the referendum. He didn't do it. He needed to cement Brexit in the minds of the British people as being a positive, and he hasn't done it. And just to say we got Brexit done of itself isn't enough. That's one area. And the second area that he got wrong, and, and, and I've no doubt this will provoke a lot of questions in a moment, but he, there's no doubt that that, Mrs. Johnson the third, <laughs> or Carrie, Carrie Antoinette, as she's better known, 
Uh, there's no doubt. Who comes up with all these sound bites? Well, I just, I mean, just make it up as you go along. It's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's no doubt she had a profound effect, effect upon him, as did the goldsmiths, as did that very wealthy, what I call the Richmond set. The Richmond set, very influential over Boris's thinking. And whilst we all want to live in a cleaner, greener, better world, uh, the mad dash for net zero has disadvantaged this country in the most astonishing way. It's disadvantaged our manufacturing industries. I mean, just look, just look at uh, the closure of our chemical plants, the closure of both of our aluminium smelters, the removal of much of British steel production. You know, we've exported manufacturing industries pursuing net zero for no net CO2 global benefit at all. Our CO2 emissions go down, global CO2 emissions actually go up because the steel that was produced in Redcar, where I was last night, is now produced in India under lower environmental standards and then shipped back to us. So levelling up, you want to level up? I'll tell you how to level up, dead easy. Let's become self-sufficient in energy. Let's stop being reliant on Qatar, Norway, Russia, Uncle Tom Cobley and all. Let's produce all of our own gas, oil and the little bits of coal that we need in this country. If you did that, you'd produce somewhere between 50 and 100,000 very well paid jobs in the north of England. You'd improve national security for this country. He did none of that. He was happy to go on importing hydrocarbons, exporting manufacturing jobs, driving up domestic bills, keeping the 5% levy on fuel bills, keeping the 25% levy on electricity bills, and now we're into a genuine cost of living crisis. And boy, can't you see it out there? You can see restaurants, you can see fewer cars on the road at night, you can see you know, Airbnb bookings in Cornwall down 20%. I mean, look wherever you want to look. There's a very scary cost of living crisis coming. There's a massive strategic question coming, and Ukraine has sharpened our focus, I think, hasn't it, on whether it's, you know, food supply, whether it's energy supply. And Boris went in completely the wrong direction on all of those things. And, and I, I, almost like it was his new religion. Um, and I think the Conservative Party, the new leader, Truss, if she doesn't find answers to that, they're going to get obliterated at the next election. So there are two things that Johnson just, just I mean, well, one he got wrong, the whole energy, the whole, the whole net zero game, he just got that wrong. Um, and and, 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 and as, as, as I said before, uh, you know, not cementing Brexit and not showing the public, they voted for him, given him a huge majority, and they were going to get something back. And mo I, mean, I was, I was, I was up, up in the red wall last night, people say, what have we got for it? And they can't see anything. So one more question on politics, yeah. and then we'll talk about business yeah. and entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a trust issue in the world? Do you trust any politicians and do you trust politics? <laughs> well, I mean, this argument, I suppose, in some ways is, is as old as the hills, isn't it? I mean, you've only got to go back to 18th century um, British cartoons of our politicians to see that trust has always been, uh, you know, an issue to some extent. Um, look, I think... Um, I think that we had a catastrophic loss of trust in politicians between 2016 and 19. There were vast numbers of leavers, but actually quite significant numbers of Remainers, disturbed by what John Burko, much of the House of Commons and House of Lords were doing. It was a willful attempt to overturn a democratic decision. I think trust in politics had reached this incredible low. And that was why, that was why in 2019, you know, I launched a new party to fight the, Euro to, to fight the European elections that nobody ever thought we had to fight. And within six weeks of launching it, we won. We came first. We got 50% more votes than the next party. That was trust. That was people saying, we're going to vote for Farage because actually he says, let's stick to what we agreed on June 23rd, 2016. And then Johnson then inherited that, and with it, a whole load of trust. And that's now gone. So I, I think trust here is back as an issue. <sighs> America is a lot more complicated. It's a lot, lot more complicated. Um, it isn't just about trust in America. I mean, Trump actually, whether you love him or hate him, Trump actually did everything he could to keep the promises he'd made in the election. 
in the first room in the West Wing, as you walk through from, from the Oval Office, the first room in the West Wing, there was a whiteboard, and literally they'd written on there by hand all the campaign promises made in the run-up to 16, and then ticked them off as they went along. And I said to Trump, in sort of 2018, he said to me, hey, you know, how am I doing? I said, you're doing great. I said, you're keeping the promises you made to people. That restores faith in the democratic system. A typical Trump. He said to me, no, 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 he said, no, 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 he said, I've kept far more promises than I made. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was in his mind. It was in his mind that he'd been elected. He'd come from the outside because people wanted something fresh and different. And, and trust for him was a big, big issue. Here it's been squandered. Um, I think the, I think the worry, the worry uh, is, you know, the more we head towards globalization and global agreements, the less actually our votes at national level matter. And I think that was, if you look back at the Brexit wars, you look back at the Trump-Clinton wars and even the rerun that's going to happen, um, in 2020, well, midterms in 2024, and the new arguments that are now springing up in Italy and elsewhere, and France, and France. I mean, French politics now is in a very, very parlous state. Um, I think this is the big debate. You know, we obviously want to do things at an international level. We want to cooperate, we want to trade, we want to form military alliances where it suits us to. But we also have to have a degree of self-control and to manage our own resources and look after our own national interests. And that, these, are, these are debates that go on for decades. But I think the only way you can fully have faith and trust in a democratic system is to feel that your vote directly affects your life in a good way or a bad way. Um, and that can only happen at a, at a national level. And that's why... That's why the Brexit debate that we've had, you're going to see that playing out over the rest of Europe, over the next decade. You are going to see that. You know, I mean, why do you think Mélenchon and Le Pen got these massive votes in the Assemblée elections? Because they're both saying the same. I mean, in a way, they're both saying the same thing. In a way, they're both saying France, at the centre of the EU, isn't really able to make decisions for the French people because it's being done on a bigger collective issue. So, so Rob, they, they are, these are things that will play out for many, many years to come. As for politicians, well, the great thing about democracy is if we don't trust them, we can at least get rid of them at every election. And that still is very important. Nigel, tax. Is the tax system fair? And is the amount of tax we're paying fair? Well, I think the worst thing about our tax system is the sheer complexity of it. I think when Osborne um, became Chancellor in 2010. I mean, Osborne. I mean, never even had a paper round in his life, and he becomes <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> uh, well, it's true, isn't it? You know, it's, it's PPE at Bloomin' Oxford or wherever it was, and it's straight into a research office, and suddenly you're the Bloomin' Chancellor. It's unbelievable. I think when, 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 when he got in there, the tax code was about 13,000 pages, UK tax code. It's now well over 20,000 pages. Now, if anybody here is a tax accountant, they'll think it's terrific. I know they will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got one of those. Yeah. <laughs> but for the rest of us, it's a blooming nightmare. Because actually, our tax rate is 2 or 3% higher than you think it is, because you've got to pay the accountant to sort the whole thing out for you. Because you dare, well, you dare not do it yourself. Otherwise, you might finish up in very real trouble. So the first problem with it is it is massively complicated. There are way too many layers um, of it. Um, are we paying the fair tax rate? Well, look, um, you know, if you look at what, um, if you look at the, what the top one percent are contributing, I mean, the top one percent are now paying about twenty-eight percent of all tax revenue. The top one percent in twenty ten were paying twenty-five percent of all. So, so the idea that the rich or the big earners aren't paying their fair share is for the birds. They are in a very, very big way. And the risk is, the risk is that you cheese them off too much. They just bugger off. They did it in the 1970s in vast numbers and took a lot of young talent with them as well. Um, 
So I frankly, I think 40% works. I actually think psychologically, a top rate of 40% works. It was interesting, wasn't it, when Lawson brought it down to that, was it 35 years ago now, it worked. And I think for the Conservatives to have allowed it to stay up at 45, plus removing all the other potential benefits they've done. So look, I think the tax burden is too high. I think we've made ourselves business-wise. I mean, business-wise, what's happening is very worrying. I think the signal that corporation tax is going to go up by 30% next April is the most incredible self-inflicted wound. That's Rishi Sunak all the way through. I mean, for that alone, to me, he doesn't deserve to be Prime Minister. Uh, but Rob, you know, we have to look at government spending as well. We have to look at government spending. And, and is it right that there are 5.3 million people of working age in this country choosing not to work and living off benefits in some way? Is that right? Well, I don't think it is. But of course, as soon as you say that, oh, you want to force the disabled to work. <laughs> to work. But I just think the system is open uh, to people sponging off it, frankly. And I, I, I think it needs to be addressed. It'll take somebody of enormous courage to do that. So, so no, the tax burden is the highest it's been since Clement Attlee. Uh, that has never been proven to be a healthy thing uh, in our country. Uh, but we've got to tackle the expenditure side. Uh, and, and, and you know what? No one ever does. Nigel, who controls the world? Well, ultimately, we do, don't we? And even if we live under oppressive regimes, we actually have the power, ultimately, to get rid of them. It's up to us as people. It's up to our own free will. We are in charge of our destiny. We are in charge of our world if we only have eyes open enough to see it and courage to do something about it. Hey, quick one. Would you like to start a business, scale a business, create multiple streams of income, get better financial education and knowledge, build a personal brand, monetize social media, work from home, create a side hustle. If you'd like any of that, go join my members area, rob.team. Cost you less than a large coffee, one third of the price of Netflix. You can cancel any time with no contract. Learn, earn, invest, build multiple streams of recurring income, digital assets, quicker, easier and cheaper, Zoom masterclasses, live event meetups, Ask Me Anything lives, exclusive content that we can't put on YouTube because it's too controversial. It's all at rob.team for less than a large coffee. Go join now at rob.team. Why don't they try and put more effort into kickstarting the economy to sort out that side? Because they don't understand the economy. They don't understand the economy. They think the economy is about the couple of dozen big companies who buy them dinner. No, I'm being absolutely, look, I'm being, don't forget, I was in Brussels for 20 years, right? For, and all the years I was in Brussels, 90% of our business regulation was not being made here. It was a point that British people struggled to get their heads around, but everything from aviation rules to speed limits, you know, you know why is it 56 miles per hour for a lorry on a motorway? Because it's 80 kilometers. You know, everything was being decided over there. And I would come back on Eurostar, you know, with these other MEPs, the other parties. Um, and we talk about everything, you know, all sorts of different industries, businesses from financial services to aviation to wherever it might be. And, you know, I'd say to British Conservatives particularly, well, why are you supporting this? Ah, because business wants it. Only last night, dear boy, I was out having dinner with... Yeah, I, I bet you were. <laughs> I bet you were. So the big businesses, the multinationals, get their voices heard. And kind of the thinking in, in, in Brussels and Westminster is that wealth in society is created by the big mega companies. It is absolute baloney. Actually, momentum is about hundreds of thousands or millions of things happening simultaneously in a country. Real growth, real momentum comes from entrepreneurship. It comes from millions of people saying, do you know what? I'm going to have a go. Do you know what? I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to borrow money. I'm going to set a company up. I'm going to have a go at something. And then I'm going to employ someone. I'm going to employ another person. That's where real, I mean, 60% of employment in the private sector comes from firms with fewer than 10 employees. How often do you ever hear that figure talked about? Like, never. And there is, I promise you, I promise you, because I'd, I'd run my own business, I'd run my own business for eight years when I first got elected to the European Parliament 
And everything I saw there and everything I've seen here indicate we're run by people who do not get this. They do not understand this. And that's because virtually nobody on either front bench has ever been in business. You know, working at Goldman Sachs for six months doesn't qualify, in my view. All right, there is a total lack of comprehension about how real growth happens um, in, the, in the economy. Um, and, and again, you know, that's, that goes down to who gets selected to stand for parliamentary seats. And I'm afraid the big parties are so in control of candidate selection, are so prone to playing it safe. You know, let's get a load of chinless wonders with no opinions, and they won't. And and, and they will, well, look at them. I mean, and they won't cause and and they won't cause us any trouble. I mean, the last thing they want free thinkers. They don't want free thinkers. They don't want people who are prepared to stand up and say, "Hey, have you thought about it like this?" or, or to defend different positions. And it goes back to the you know, really second question we touched on, which is, I think, if we move to AV plus or something like that. You know, you'd start to see some different voices in the House of Commons and you, you get a different voice. I mean, it happened to me, it happened to me. So it's a good illustration of how you can change national debate. 1999, there were three of us from UKIP elected to the European Parliament, to the horror, horror of the establishment. <laughs> I, I, it's funny, my first day in Brussels, first day, the three of us sat here and the British ambassador, Sir Stephen Wall came in with two Foreign Office acolytes and they sat that side of the bench and we sat this side of the bench and there was sort of an interminable 30, 40 second silence which the ambassador broke by saying, gentlemen, what are your intentions? I mean, I think he thought I was a terrorist. I, mean, I, I said, I'm not Guy Fawkes, I haven't come to blow it up. Um, but, but, but that's how outside the thinking at the time of the media, political and business class was. How can we have elected representatives who think we should leave the European Union? But do you know what happened? Because of that, I got onto question time. And because of that, the newspaper started writing about me. And then suddenly social media comes along. And even though we were very, very few people, the fact we had elected office allowed us to propagate an argument, an argument that picked up support and grew. And the same would happen for entrepreneurship and business, with a different electoral system, we would get people in that parliament who would stand up and start making these arguments. So at the moment, I'm sorry to say uh, that entrepreneurship is barely represented uh, there in the House of Commons, or certainly in the thinking of Whitehall. It's a massive, massive problem. And the real frustration, and every one of us in this room knows that this country has got amazing potential. That we genuinely have fantastic potential. Um, and it's not for government, to make us a success, it's for government to get the blooming hurdles and obstacles out of the way to allow us to make a success of it. And they're just not doing it. So do you think that's the key to kickstarting the economy or is there something else? Look, the, 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 the only way, the only way you get out of a mess like this is through growth. I mean, if I'm frank about the 80s, Thatcher actually wasn't very good at cutting. You know, the idea that Thatcher you know, used the knife and slashed budgets and sacked loads of civil servants, well, she didn't really do that. She didn't really do that. Um, what she did do was to tackle inflation, and that was a very painful medicine. But ultimately, we grew our way out of the problem, and by 1988, we had a PSDR, a public sector debt repayment. We were paying off national debt every year with the budget. So growth is that right now, I think growth is the key to absolutely everything. And I think growth, that's why actually trust is half right on this. I, I think, I mean, just, just think about it. You know, the windfall tax, I a bit of conservative government, I put a windfall tax on gas and oil companies. Forget the fact that the previous year they all lost billions when the price was low. Once you put a windfall tax on one sector, why not next year put a windfall tax on another sector. What message is that to investors in tech or whatever else it may be? What message is that to the world? They're bad signals, very, very bad signals. So, so, so look, you know, we, we've, we've got to make sure people have the right incentives and, and we've got to make sure tax is low. But actually, actually, I think if you look at certain states in America, I mean, take, take Georgia, for example. 
Now, he's timed out now, but they had an entrepreneurial governor called Nathan Deal. Deal did two terms in Georgia as their governor. And go governors of states in America have real power. I mean, they really do. And Deal was a supply sider. Deal was all about growth. For the, the last four-year term of Deal in Georgia, which ended two years ago, Georgian growth was 4.4%, averaged 4.4%, almost double what the rest of America did over that period of time. Why? Because of incentives. Why? Because of supply-side reform. Why? Because he got government out of the way. Um, and this is exactly what Reagan did all those years earlier. And actually, to a large extent, what Thatcher did. You know, let's be fair to the Thatcher government. They did remove a lot of obstacles to business and let people get on with it. So, so yes, Rob, without growth, this country is in a lot of trouble. Let's talk about media. So you obviously have gone through the journey of being very involved in mainstream media and always in the press. And then mainstream media has evolved and maybe it's dying. And now you've got a big social media presence. So how have you seen that? change? Oh, I mean, look, um, first things first, newspapers. You know, we should actually th count ourselves incredibly lucky in this country. We have got one of the best newspaper industries in the world. Now, they're the cruelest, they're the nastiest, and when you get the phone call at midday on a Saturday from one of the Sundays, you know it's not going to be good, I can promise you. Um, but we're lucky with our newspapers. We have, we have a really terrific, you know, plurality of view across our newspapers. You know, from The Guardian, to The Mirror, to the FT, to the Daily Mail, on the other end. So, so that side of our media life is very, very well covered. Most of them have gone online quite successfully, Telegraph particularly, with nearly three quarters of a million subscribers. So that part of our media is good, I think. And, and, and they're horrible. I mean, they're, some of the stuff they write, you know, is almost, you, you, if, if, when it's about you, you, you sort of almost can't read it. But where we've had the really big problem has been broadcast media. And broadcast media, television, radio, have generally been London SW1-dominated views, wall-to-wall. Uh, -wall. You know, topic after topic in which there is basically no debate. There is a received wisdom on these issues. They think they're being neutral, but they're not, because the type of people that work in the BBC, ITV, Sky, etc. And that was where social media came in. I mean, YouTube really hit this country in about 2007, I guess. Uh, I would never have done what I've done without, without that. N never. Um, I remember in 2008, the financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, and I was getting up in the European Parliament questioning the bond spreads that were emerging with Greek bonds, uh, Italian bonds, precursor to the bailouts, um, ECB buying masses of their own, or of, 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 of the nation's own bonds. And I was getting up talking about these things. Um, and, 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 and it was amazing that my brother, who was sitting at a trading desk in the city, would have my speech sent to him by Zero Hedge, the big financial markets platform in New York, and they would pick up my speech and send it out to all their subscribers. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. You know, I realised the power of this thing. And then I started to realise every speech I gave in the European Parliament actually could have a really big, because the BBC were never going to cover what I said, could really have a big audience. Um, and I remember in about 2009, giving a speech, and the leader of the Liberals, a, a chap called Verhofstadt, Belgium politician, and Verhofstadt got up, he said, uh, Mr Farage, he said, all he does when he comes to this Parliament is he gives these speeches because he wants to get big numbers of views on social media. I said, yeah, it's a fair cop. I, yeah, you know, I, I get. So, yeah, social media, for me, YouTube to begin with, uh, and then with Twitter, that then became, I mean, literally everything you tweeted became a press release and could be picked up by local newspapers all around the country or national papers or French newspapers or whatever it was. Obviously, Facebook developed as kind of a fan club. That's really what Facebook became. So, look, I've been, I've been, I've been using... I've been using social media more heavily than any other British political figure and probably any other British media figure you know, since all of this started. Um, the trouble is, Rob, that you know, they, huh, they realised 
by opening up the gates to free speech, these big West Coast billionaires, that what they'd created was the means by which people like me and Donald Trump could have a good day. <laughs> um, and they have cracked down on it, you know, very severely. I mean, look, you know, none of us want the platforms to allow incitement, hatred, uh, any of that stuff. But I think the effective shadow banning of many conservative views has been real. It's been going on for a very, very long time. Um, and that's why there's a plethora of new platforms developing. Um, and that's, um, you know, we're obviously looking at uh, Getter, Parler, Truth Social is just kind of getting off the ground. Rumble, Ga oh, we can go on. I mean, there's, there's a lot of alternatives out there. Which ones succeed, which ones fail, I just don't know. But, but TikTok as well, I mean, I, that's amazing. I mean, I don't, you know, I just started doing TikTok a few months ago. I wasn't mad on doing it because of the ownership. That did concern me a bit. But in the end, I said, right, I've got to do it. So anyway, I do TikTok and it's quite fun because I tell all these kids, to challenge their teachers. <laughs> uh, yeah, challenge your teachers. Uh, the Jubilee was particularly good. You know, be proud of the Queen. Don't be ashamed of our past. You know, you'll hear all this rubbish about slavery. We're the ones that got rid of it, all this stuff. So I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm, I'm like a counter-revolutionary <laughs> against what they're being taught. Um, and um, anyway, I was walking into the GB News office in Paddington at three o'clock about, I don't know, six weeks ago, something like that. And it was three o'clock and one of the year groups had been let out of the school down the road. And there's like, I don't know, 60, 80, 15 year old kids. And they're, they're off to get some coaches to go somewhere or whatever it was. And uh, one of them shouts out, look at that, it's the TikTok guy. <laughs> 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 so there you are, I mean, they wouldn't, but, you know, when there was a referendum, they'd have been nine or ten. So it wouldn't have really crossed that, you know, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't have known who I am. But, but, but I found through TikTok, wow. I mean, I mean it, it, so these are all very, very powerful things. But again, you see, I mean, I, you know, I talked about our, our politicians a moment ago, and I said to you, they had no comprehension of small business, of entrepreneurship. Have a look at the cabinet. Have a look at their social media followings. They're almost non-existent. They're almost non-existent. When you're a party leader or a prime minister, they'll pay fortunes to push you out there and get a following. But, I mean, you know, Penny Morden, this big success. You know, how many Facebook followers has she got? 18,000. None of them have taken it seriously. None of them have understood it. And that's why I go back to that point again and again and again, that the political system we've got is not giving us the right kind of leaders. They're not switched into where the 21st century is. What would you say is your biggest success? And it sounds a bit corny, but to have four pretty healthy, well-balanced kids isn't bad, because it's not been easy for them either. You know, this surname is not always, always, always a bonus at British universities, I can tell you. <laughs> can you imagine? What of them did politics. Should we do a quick fire round to finish, Nigel? Well, as you wish. <laughs> I'll probably get caught out here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, maybe 15 to 30 second answers each one. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who knows Donald Trump, is he misunderstood? Hugely, deliberately, willfully. That's because he's challenging the global establishment on almost everything. He's got his faults, he's got his flaws, but he's a great guy and he woke us up to something that none of us had really thought about properly, China. He started to make us think about China and that I, I think actually is b before him, we weren't talking about it, very important. What would you say to all the startup and small business owner entrepreneurs in the world we're in right now? Uh, well, actually, volatility um, and tough times. Uh, you know, one thing I learned as a trader uh, is you, you really want to buy in falling markets, not rising ones, because you get better value. Uh, and however bad government is, however ghastly politicians are, there are always still ways to succeed if you're determined. Uh, and, if, and also, you know what? There, there are no shortcuts. You've got to work hard. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Or oh, getting married, obviously. <laughs> um, the, um, <laughs> more than once. Anyway, the, um, the, no. Well, biggest personal risk I've taken, well, getting in that aeroplane that crashed was one, I suppose. But no, biggest personal risk I took was giving up a career in 
giving up a career in commodities to go into politics. I mean, that was, you know, and, and to do it for a, what was a very fringe party and a minority cause. That was my biggest risk, but, but in a sense, that was my entrepreneurship. My entrepreneurship was in politics. It was to create, set up something new in politics and try and change the agenda. And I had a bit of success doing it. But as I say, there were no shortcuts. What would you say is your biggest success? My biggest success? Um, well, I suppose, and it sounds a bit corny, but to have four pretty healthy, well-balanced kids isn't bad. That isn't bad. Because um, it's not been easy for them either. You know, this surname is not always, <laughs> not always a bonus at British universities, I can tell you. Um, uh, <laughs> I think, yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, One of them did politics. You know. <laughs> yeah. I, studied all the, I studied all the professors. I found out half of them teaching him were on Brussels grants. Yeah, yeah. He, he did share that with them, I think. Um, the, um, no, I mean, look, my biggest, I think my biggest success was to take an issue, to take an issue that was just not discussed in polite society and turn it into a mainstream national debate. That was my biggest success. Changing, influencing arguments, agendas. And I want to go on doing that. I want to go on doing that, whether it's in media, whether it's in politics, whether it's lecturing, you know, that's what excites me. I think that the, I think human beings are very, very prone to groupthink. They all get into thinking one thing. And the more wrong it is, the more they convince themselves that it's right. And I do see myself as somebody that occasionally can come along and challenge those things. And I enjoy doing it. I like being the outsider. <laughs> What's the best advice you can ever remember receiving? Best advice I ever received was from a man called Christopher Booker, who died two years ago. Christopher Booker was the founding editor of Private Eye, was a Sunday Times columnist for 50 years, um, author of many books, great, some really great books. And Booker was a wise old bird, um, a lifelong liberal, West Country liberal, uh, but he'd become very much a Brexiteer and thought Brexit actually was consistent with old value liberalism, not what it is today. Anyway, so in 99, I get elected to the European Parliament. I thought I had half a chance, but I never really, really, really thought it would happen. And the result came through at about, I don't know, 1.30, 1.45 in the morning. And of course, I went straight to bed. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the next morning, it's sort of 7 o'clock, and I've got to be in London for a press conference at 10 or whatever feeling absolutely terrible, you know. And the phone rings, and it was Booker. And he said to me, young man, he said, I've been covering current affairs as a serious journalist, as a satirist, you know, for nearly 40 years. He said, and I can tell you, everybody in politics becomes one of two things. Either they're in politics to be someone, or they're in politics because they want to do something. He said, you make your mind up today which of those you are and never confuse the two. And he was absolutely right. Because for most people, politics is about social status. For most people, politics is about climbing the greasy pole. It's about becoming a minister, a prime minister, or whatever it is. And I realised from that moment, I couldn't give a damn about any of that. I was in it because I wanted to change things. And that was fantastic advice. I never, ever, ever forgot it. I'm just writing that down. I like never that forgot it. Never forgot it. And there are other people out. I mean, you know, there are other politicians out there on right and left who are there as principled people who want to change things, who have convictions and beliefs. But most of Western politics has been completely taken over by the careerist um, to the detriment of free thinking. Nigel, who controls the world? Oh. <laughs> now, David Icke um, is a friend of mine. Um, so, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> He's been on the show twice, actually. He always blows our channel. I know. Of course he does. <laughs> yeah. Of course he does. No, look, who controls the world? Well, ultimately, we do, don't we? We do. We do. And even if we live under oppressive regimes, we actually have the power, ultimately, to get rid of them. I, I, I just don't go with, you know, the vast conspiracy theories of it's the Rothschild or, or the Masons or whatever it is. Uh, you know, human beings form themselves into groups for their own advantage. Where's the shock in that? Where's the surprise in that? You know, wh why are we surprised about the World Economic Forum? Why are we surprised about that? That's what groups of human beings do. 
ultimately, it's up to us as people. It's up to our own free will. We are in charge of our destiny. We are in charge of our world. If we only have eyes open enough to see it and courage to do something about it. Two more. What's your biggest regret, Nigel? Biggest regret? Be honest with you. Jim, be honest with you. I just don't look back. I just don't look back. I haven't got time. I'm too busy enjoying the moment. I, I, you know, I, I don't have profound regrets. I mean, there are, you know, there are things we've all said and done. There are people we've perhaps upset that we shouldn't have done. There are maybe things with our families we could have done better. I bet there's no one in this room who doesn't think that. There are things we all could have done better. Um, but how can I have regrets? I, I mean, I survived a road traffic accident I should never have got out of. Quite a big cancer scare, which wasn't a barrel of laughs. And a plane crash that nobody should ever have survived. How can I have regrets? I shouldn't even be alive. I'm just happy to be here. It's as simple as that. How do you deal with critics, trolls and haters? Ignore the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Go down the pub, have a couple of pints, turn the phone off. It, it quite... But you don't ignore them all. I know, no, you don't. It, it's quite difficult. I mean, I, I never forget, it was six weeks before the European elections of 2014. It was the first Sunday I wasn't doing media for months because normally it was the Andrew Marr programme or it was, you know, whatever it was on Sky or whatever it, whatever it was. And it was the first Sunday, yeah, literally, that I didn't have a big sort of set of interviews in London to do. And the night before, it, it, it had broken the night before with the YouGov poll that UKIP was in the lead for the European elections. And I can tell you something, there's only one thing in life worse than being behind, and that's being in front. Because being in front's scary. Because being in front means everyone's firing their arrows at you. And I remember the next morning, about half seven, the phone rang and it was my lawyer. Now, if your lawyer rings you at half seven on a Sunday morning, I mean, this is not necessarily what you want to hear. And he says to me, have you read the papers yet? I said, be honest, Andrew. I said, I was slightly celebrating last night after the news were in the lead. He said, don't. He said, don't even buy the papers. Don't go online. He said, just take the morning off. Spend my time at home with the family. He said, we'll deal with it all tomorrow in my office. And... Mark, we need a lawyer like I that. actually <laughs> took his advice. I, I, no, I actually did take his advice. Did that not make you want to read the papers even well, more? Well, it did, but I thought, no, 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 no. Actually, he's given me good advice. I've been working like crazy for months. You know, obviously, you think, oh, wow, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. And you get the odd hint with text what it might be and might not be. But, but no, I didn't sit down and study it at all. And then the next morning, I sat down with him and went through it. And I think the first words I uttered to him were, Christ, I mean, you know, look at this. And this guy, very, very top London lawyer, very experienced, had some really big customers over the years. I said to him, what do I do? He said, nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He said, they're trying to attack your personality. They're trying to damage your credibility. He said, they're not attacking your policies at all. They're not having a go at the policy platforms you've set out. They're trying to paint out that you're an unsuitable figure. He said, you know, he said to, to sue people, to fight back against people. Um, he, said, he said, it's li literally pointless. He said, in any way, if the British public think you're a chain-smoking, hard-drinking, gambling womanizer, he said, probably more a vote for you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. When, when you're under fire, it's tough. Um, it is tough. But you know what? Going to law, going to law, I, ha and I have done it a couple of times, but going to law in any libel, defamation action, all it does, it soaks up your emotion, it soaks up your energy, it soaks up your time. Your and money. Even, and, and the risk, the financial risk is massive. And three, in fact, three actions in total over all those years. One action ended in a score draw but a newspaper apology, and two actions did end in victories, actually, and some compensation being paid to family members who pre-Leverson, because pre-Leverson, they'd be going for your family as well. You know, it was, it was <laughs> that, and, and, and I can take it, but those around me didn't deserve it. Um, but even when you've won, you've lost, because it's taken up so much of your time. So I think there are times when you have to fight back on social media and elsewhere, 
But I, I generally, you know, unless you're, unless you're being accused of something that really is criminal or really is wrong, my advice, keep moving forwards. Don't worry about it. And if you weren't doing something right, they wouldn't be attacking you anyway. So I don't let it worry me. Ladies and gentlemen, Nigel Farage. <laughs> Thank you, Nigel. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you want to watch another Disruptors interview with disruptive guests, watch here. And before you go, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on.